Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Kevin Ward, the editor of South Wales Argus and southwellsargus.co.uk. Uh, we're media partners for Digital 2015 and very proud to, uh, to be so. Um, I'm delighted that the organisers have uh, made sure that a finely honed athlete is chairing this uh, panel. Um, but I am, I am a sports mad, so I, I'm very interested in how technology works. And really, you've only got to look uh, over the weekend uh, at, at sport that was across all the television to see how important technology is, whether it's the, the team of technicians behind uh, Lewis Hamilton's Grand Prix win uh, on Sunday, uh, or the team behind Andy Murray, or the team uh, behind Sir Bradley Wiggins as he broke the uh, World Hour record. Um, or England against Ireland, which uh, was basically the players putting Instagram pictures out for their holidays. Um, so uh, the panel's uh, been introduced to you, but uh, it's probably a good idea if uh, they introduce themselves uh, to you as well and tell you a little bit about uh, what they do uh, and how technology impacts um, on them from a couple of, a couple of minutes then for, uh, from each. So, uh, Neil, do, would you like to kick off? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Ward. I'm the Chief Executive of the Welsh Football Trust. Um, we're quite a unique organisation in a, in a football context within a governing body because we're a registered charity set up by the Football Association of Wales under their umbrella to um, develop the grassroots game, so essentially more players, to identify the next generation of talented players coming through, so establish the pathway and develop um, future te players for the success of the national teams. Uh, and coaching, so developing a pathway for coaching from grassroots level all the way up to the professional level. So from a leader's award to the professional UA for professional license, which is the highest uh, qualification in, in football coaching. Um, I suppose my input from here will not be as a, as a user of technology as such. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a working at a decision-making policy level. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of how we use technology. Obviously, some insights already been given uh, around at an elite performance level and how um, data and information is being used to, to test and enhance performance. Um, certainly from a coaching perspective, we use technology to assist coaches in their development, so give them um, feedback in terms of how they're progressing as coaches. And also in terms of developing players, so giving them feedback, planning the strategy for games, um, identifying uh, tactical weaknesses or strengths in the opposition, and then planning the strategy around that. So technology is used in, in many different ways, and, and hopefully I can contribute in some small way to this discussion as to, to how fo football is applying it. Uh, Keith, please. Hi, <coughs> my name is Keith Thomas, I'm from uh, Bailey Technologies. Um, the founder of uh, Bailey, a chap called Steve Hudd, um, quite an active guy, enjoyed racing, enjoyed um, climbing, uh, diving, what have you, and latterly horse racing. He had a horse in Limerick, leading with a, a one fence to go, a few strides away, and attendant went. Uh, now the guy, the, the, the jockey had to take the jump, couldn't, couldn't pull it to that stage there, and the horse damaged another tendon upon landing. By the time Steve got there, they said, okay, horse has had it, it's going to be put down, end of story. And Steve's a fairly stubborn guy. He said, well, why does it have to be? You know, can't we nurse it back, monitor it? No, no, it's a complete waste of time. Anyway, that was about six, seven years ago. Uh, and Steve took about five years to develop a technology to get to the end of the story. Effectively, it takes heat, uh, uh, thermal images of tendons. A tendon will get pretty hot when it's racing, will stay hot for four or five hours, and then will cool down for two, three hours if it's healthy. If it's not, it stays hot. There's bad heat there, which is because of extra blood flow to, to, to cause heat damage. And the clever bit, the really thing that's taken the five years, is to make sure that you've got um, a way of taking out different factors. Ambient temperature, how long the horse will be racing for, was it kicked the day before, was a little hot spot there, etc. But now we've got technology which can basically uh, take images, and it's being tested as we speak in uh, one yard in England, which is owned by one of the Middle East chicks, and they're pretty crazy with their horses, and they... Don't mind spending the money either, if it, if it works, obviously. And with another uh, ex-footballer, actually, who's, um, who's in, quite into his horse racing, by the way. And it's been tested there. That's it. You're not going to name a name there, the, the ex-footballer? No, 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 no. So that's my glove. I, I could do uh, No, I'll just shoot you afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Simon, please. Um, yeah, my name's Simon Farrant. I, I work for Opta, which is part of Perform Group. Um, if you've not heard of us, Opta, we're a data collection and distribution company. Um, we collect uh, detailed data on uh, football, rugby and cricket mainly, but a number of other sports as well, um, globally. 
We then package that and distribute it to uh, clients in a number of different sectors, including um, professional clubs and teams, uh, performance analysis departments, such as the one that, that um, Reese runs, um, but also to broadcasters and digital media, uh, governing bodies. So we work with the Premier League and Bundesliga and MLS and Premiership Rugby and ECB and a number of others around the world. Uh, bookmakers and sponsors and brands as well to uh, use data to enhance their, their offerings and their, uh, their advertising for, uh, for their product. Thanks, Simon. Rhys? Uh, yes, my name is uh, Rhys Long. I'm uh, head of uh, performance analysis for the Welsh Rugby Union, um, which basically in a rugby-mad uh, country like Wales is, uh, is pretty good because the union pay me to watch rugby pretty much every day. So uh, it's a pretty enviable job. And um, the, the, the one thing in terms of our approach in terms of digital technology or, um, or data is uh, it, it's got to underpin uh, the coaches and, and the players, essentially. Um, you know, there's nothing more um, compelling than a, a coach's gut feeling. And sometimes the data, uh, whether it supports it or not, has got to underpin that, um, especially um, with a winning coach as well. Uh, the other thing with... Um, with data and, and our sports science uh, team is that we really need good players. That's the, the be all and end all of it. If, if your players haven't got ability, then you're not gonna win a thing. Um, so unfortunately at the moment, you know, we've got some, some pretty good players and some world-class players uh, and, and they are probably the best people to collaborate with in terms of when you're looking at data and software um, because they're the ones who are getting um, looked at in the most minutest detail and so if they want anything displayed or they need stuff to improve their learning, then they're the ones that are going to be coming up to you with ideas. And so everything's run past them first before we, we put anything into action. Um, the, the, the big thing from, from our point of view is um, there's a lot of buzzwords at the moment in terms of big data. But essentially, you know, what we try to do is, is try to use the most pertinent things that actually improve performance. There's no point collecting everything just because you can. Uh, and it's all about has that had any effect on your performance because if it hasn't there's no point collecting it or no point trying to display it to players because otherwise they'll just get bogged down in an absolute deluge of data and as you can all see at the moment you know everyone's got a smartphone everyone's emailing over there with the iPad uh, <laughs> doesn't even realize <laughs> got you <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you know, data is freely available at the moment, and what you've got to do is realise, you know, when to use it and when not to. And I think that's the one of the most important things from, from you know, the whole digital era as we are at the moment, is is actually knowing when to use when to use data. Um, so for me, hopefully, we'll get some some insightful questions, um, just to trigger you the two areas for for this year that we're looking at. Um, really in terms of making a big explosion in our, our virtual reality. Um, you know, we've got a, a massive big training camp at the moment, but obviously, you know, we try to a absolutely kill these players in terms of, uh, of the training that they're going to be doing over the next couple of months. Um, but if we, can, if we can bring a new player into the environment and actually show him, you know, the speed of thought that he's going to have to have and some of these top players have got through that kind of mechanism, then, then that's a big area for us. And the other one is, um, is machine learning. You know, I think that's going to be the big thing is, is you know, there's a, an app that's just come out yesterday called Rip It, which basically surfers can upload their GoPro videos. And basically the, the company's taught it how to recognize when you stand up on your board. And so within 10 minutes, it's made a highlights reel without you even telling it what you want to look for. And, and for me, that's amazing that we're in a, an age at the moment where, you know, I can upload a video and in 10 minutes, it's showing me all of my clips without doing anything else. So uh, hopefully there'll be some questions like that. Thanks, Reese. I, I know we've already met uh, Natalie and Karis, but there may be some people uh, who've only just arrived in the room waiting for Reese to come in, I expect. Um, but uh, so can you just briefly tell us again uh, what you do, Natalie? Please? Yeah, um, my name's Natalie Williams. Uh, I work for Welsh Cycling, um, and I'm actually an exercise physiologist working with them. So part of what I'm doing is gathering the data, inferring that data, and then um, feeding that back to the coaches and athletes so then we can have an impact on training. Everything is about working towards um, the kind of one common goal. But as Reese has kind of just said, we need the riders in the first place in order to be able to develop them and even think about reaching the goal of getting them to Rio and competing with the best in the world. So, yeah. Oh, you've got one. <laughs> 
I'm Karis Jones. I work as a performance analyst with Wealth Cycling. Um, don't want to repeat what's already been said through Reese and Nat. Um, basically, I'm there to collect as much data as we can to, to basically find our targets, see what our targets are going to be in the future and what we need to achieve. Um, obviously, we don't need to collect so much data, but what the coach, we go on what the coach wants and all that is led by the coach and then we try and provide them with a, m as much information as we possibly can. Thank you, panel. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions of the panel and then we'll... we'll uh put it out to, to, to you guys. Uh, we've got about uh, 35 minutes, I think. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, technology changes all the time, uh, obviously. Um, what sort of, of, of the latest technological trends are, are kind of most important uh, in your sector? Simon, can we, can we start with you, please? Thank you. Um, so in terms of technological trends, so the, the data that we collect and distribute um, only forms one certainly in the performance analysis departments of clubs and teams, only forms one small part of the, of the, the data they're receiving. Um, we provide on the ball data, so in football, it's every time a player touches the ball anywhere on the pitch, and then what they do with that, that ball when they receive it, and what they, you know, what they do with it. So that equates to around between 1,600 and 2,000 on the ball actions every game, depending on um, depending on which team's playing, it's less if it's Stoke, more if it's Barcelona, you know, that sort of thing. But um, that will only form a small part. Um, clubs now are ingesting data from other sources. There will be um, tracking data that's part of that mix, so optical tracking data, which will be um, tracking the speed, accelerations, distance covered, um, movements of all the players on the pitch at any one time, and the ball. Um, there's also, in some sports, uh, GPS data. Uh, in football, FIFA won't allow that on pitch yet, although that is, that is, that is coming. But in, in rugby, there's, there's GPS data that clubs will be um, taking in and, and using. And so in terms of technological trends, it's, it's, it's very much getting to a point where clubs are looking for um, a platform or uh, basically uh, people that can ingest all of that data and make sense of it, make use of it. I mean, I, you know, we as an organization, we, we would never advocate that clubs should be run purely on data, exactly as Reese was saying. You know, it, it's one small part of a, uh, of, of a much broader mix. Um, but what's crucial is that the insight that people are getting from this data is, is useful and is actionable. So. Um, yeah, techn software platforms that, that, that combine, to use the buzzword, big data and provide actionable um, insights, I guess, is, is one of the trends we're seeing at the moment. Thank you. There's probably a way to persuade FIFA, I suspect, to, uh, to help you out on that one. Um, uh, Neil, in, in your area, and I know you obviously talked about the fact that technology is not sort of primed to, to your particular role, but in terms of the coaching courses that uh, the FAW Trust run from, from Dragon Park, I mean, what are the, what are the most important set technological trends that uh, your coaches are using? Um, well, one we use in the moon is uh, Global Coach, which is a platform which can help um, players understand the strategy that you're building up between practices leading up into the games um, so and that can be used in a myriad of ways I mean in terms of strategy so one of the challenges Chris Coleman has as as manager is he doesn't have the level of contact time they would like with his players and invariably although um, this Belgian game is a uh, uh, is exceptional and as much as he's got two weeks to get them together usually he might have a week with two games and during that week he might only have a 20 minute session whereby he has all his players fit on the pitch and ready to start. So a lot of the time will be spent off the pitch um, planning strategy and showing players the types of movements that uh, they would like to see, how they're going to defend uh, both individually and collectively as, as, as units, how, they, how they're going to um, attack or use um, set plays in order to, um, to, uh, to attack in, in, the, in those formations. But, but it's also used as well in terms of a coach education tool to um, help coaches to understand the types of practices they need to do in order to develop as coaches through the pathway that they're undertaking at, uh, at, each, at each particular level. And there's also things, uh, collaboration platforms as well. We're using a system called Sports Session Planner, which 
enables coach, coaches to put in one place the types of sessions that they're using, but also collaborate with other coaches on particular practices they're looking to see so they, they can accumulate those sessions one place and, and um, focus on the types of um, sessions they want to, to use in order to develop. So those are sort of two examples um, that we're using at present. Uh, Karis, you, you talked earlier about some of the new uh, software and technology that, that you're using even, even in the last month or so. Um, how, how aware do you need to be of, of what else is out there and how it could potentially improve uh, the cyclists? Yeah, you've definitely got to be aware of constantly what's being brought out that's new. Um, there's things coming out every single day that you could use. Um, but it comes down to what is actually going to work in your environment. Uh, we need to make sure that the coach is able to use it as well as yourself um, and it's making sure that you're actually going to get a lot out of that piece of equipment or software. Um, so you could, go, you could go out and buy any piece of equipment but if it's not bespoke to you and for what you want it to achieve so you don't want to go around changing everything again afterwards. It's just making sure that everything that you get is actually for what you need it for. Keith, you're, you're obviously providing new technology uh, in, in the sporting arena. You, I guess, therefore, have got to be aware of what your competitors are doing and, and what else is being developed. And, and, and how, how important is that to you to make sure you stay one step ahead? It wasn't much that, actually. It's more a case of, I think, I think thermal imaging had a bad image, if right. you pardon the pun. Uh, it, it was a case of, OK, there's a hot spot there, there's a problem, we'll do it. Um, it took a long time to be able to convince people that this thing was a little bit different. Uh, and that we were comparing you know, data with the day before and taking out the extraneous factors such as ambient temperature, whether it's a sunny day, all those sort of things there. Um, you can be aware of, of new technology coming in in terms of, of cameras. Uh, you know, we, our cameras are measured at 0.2 degrees centigrade. Normally a coach would, would, uh, or a trainer would, would run his or her hands down the horse's leg and feel a temperature spot between 2 degrees and 4 degrees. This is one-tenth of that, so it'll spot it a lot easier. Um, but obviously, yeah, you're, always, you're always aware of what's going on with technology. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you keep your eyes open. And uh, so, although horse racing is a small C conservative industry, it has to be said. Okay, Reese, wh wh when I played rugby in the sort of late 70s and early 80s, performance analysis was kind of how many people you managed to punch and how much uh, <laughs> aftershave you drank after the game. But um, wh how how uh, difficult or easy is it for you to get across? the information you're gathering to, to, to an average player? Um, at the, well, if we take a step back, when, when I first came in around about 2007, 2008, we, we, had, a, we had a bit of a problem in terms of you know, um, the amount of data um, that players could take on board about the stuff they were looking at. Um, so what we did, we, um, we actually went right back to the grassroots. So we went back to 16-year-olds. Uh, and we put a lot of time and money uh, into that, taking it away from the national team, actually went through and tried to build a system uh, down at 16, 17 uh, year old players. So that we were actually analyzing them at the same level as w of what we were analyzing the, the national team at. Um, and basically over a, a period of, uh, of seven or eight years, um, what we've seen is those players have grown up with being analyzed like that, using the information uh, effectively um, and also, just in terms of the technology, those kids are coming through, and you know, kids of today aren't writing with pencils and pens anymore. They're on tablets, so you have to cater for that that generation. And, and what we've seen now is that we've had an absolute surge over the last three, four years of younger players, and they're so comfortable in terms of using the information. Um, they're actually pushing the boundaries to us which makes us get better and better because they're so, um, they, they've got such an affinity with what we're producing because everything is standardised across the whole Welsh Rugby Union from 16 to top. So ultimately, players coming in, you know, we don't have to show them anymore how to use a computer. They already know. So then the next thing is how to use data properly and how to actually improve their performance. Thank you. Simon, the information that Opta provide, uh, and obviously Opta have been doing this for, I guess, probably, I don't know, maybe 15 years, something like that. Organisations might, like mine use it. Uh, how much more demand do you find you're getting from, from media organisations that have thought for even more detailed information? Yeah, uh, dramatically. I think, um, so if we use football as an example, um, we started collecting football in, in, in what we call full detail. Um, so 
every pass, every on the ball action, probably in around 2006, 2007. And it got to a point in 2008, 2009, even 2010, around the 2010 World Cup, where we were saying, why are we spending so much time and effort doing this? Why, why are we doing all this live, collecting all this data across all these different competitions live to this level of accuracy with this much detail? Because we're not seeing the returns. We're not seeing people um, com you know, taking this information. They're not taking the most detailed information. But it's almost got to a point now where the market has caught up with what we were doing and actually almost now superseded, so now we're investing in new technologies and new ways and new, new data collection systems. Um, we went from uh, around probably 100, 150 clients, I would guess, in um, kind of the late noughties, if that's, if that's a word, to we're over 800 clients now, uh, globally. And what you're seeing now is um, certainly uh, in the UK and the US, it's a very kind of... Um, data savvy audience, you know, you still get people saying, well, stats don't belong in sports, you know, it's rubbish, and then they'll quote the league table or the, you know, points difference, which is the statistics in itself. But then we're now seeing huge growth in other regions. So across Europe, um, Germany especially, but also France, Spain, Italy increasingly. Uh, Australia, we've seen a huge growth because of the growth of popularity of football, but also um, across rugby and cricket as well, um, are increasing work in, in those sports. And then um, now Southeast Asia as well. So we're seeing a dramatic growth from um, media organizations across the world. And a big part of that has been to do with the fact that we became the... Um, it's to do with the growth of the Premier League. We became the official data supplier to, or data provider for the, um, the Barclays Premier League in 2012. And that's allowed us to dramatically expand our work and our, our reach um, across the globe and to different markets. And, yeah, we, we, we don't get that resistance anymore. We don't get the uh, sense that people aren't buying into what we're doing. If anything, as I say, people are demanding more and more from us. So it's been a dramatic shift in the way people are consuming sports, I think. Okay. Natalie, just picking up on, on Reese's point there about how kind of, you know, younger sports people kind of get the technology. Do, do you find that? Is it easier for you to work with, with younger cyclists? or? Yeah, definitely. And also, not just the cyclists, but also the coaches. Obviously, a lot of what we do, we have to be able to feed back to the coaches. Um, and some of the kind of more senior coaches that might have the technical knowledge don't necessarily have the technical knowledge of the sport that is, don't necessarily have kind of the the knowledge of how to use that software, how to use that technology. Um, so it's one, find a technology that works for them, but two, the younger coaches, they've had more experience with this, so it's a lot easier to be able to use that information and inform training and inform competition with that kind of younger generation, definitely. Okay. Uh, Neil, you, you at Dragon Park, you've attracted some pretty big names on, uh, to your coaching courses, people like uh, Thierry Henry and Sol Campbell and Mike Flynn. Um, <laughs> why, why is that happening? Why, why are our sort of big names in terms of former pros come into the FAW to do their coaching badges? Well, I think a big part of it is, is down to the technical director, Oshin Roberts, who's, who's highly respected. And it's quite unusual in a football context because, you know, ex-pros um, judge people by how they, you know, what level someone's played the game at, and Oshun didn't play at a high level, but he's, he's very much a student in the game. And I think in Wales, we've always had a very um, open philosophy when it comes to, to coach education. You know, we don't, we don't tell people what to coach. We, we talk about how to coach and developing the toolkit that they'll need to become a coach. And I think it's that, that open philosophy. And also, you know, when you've got people of the likes of Henri um, in a room, they know the game they know um, what needs to be done. It's more about how they communicate and articulate that and manage that in terms of, of leading and developing players. So much of it is also about facilitating the, the knowledge and experience that you have in the room. And um, coach, people of that caliber is hugely beneficial for us in terms of our coaches coming through the system because it's clearly inspiring for them to, to hear from these coaches. But it's, it's really interesting players at that level and um, you don't see it always how how sort of humble they are in a way and as much they're very clear the likes of Desai, um, Vieira, Ginola that they were good players excellent players in their time but that was then they're now starting a new chapter in their life and they're looking to start um, 
um, from, from scratch, as it were. And even they themselves, you know, they feel challenged by the types of technology they're having to use in order to communicate uh, to, 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 to players. And they're very much relying on some of the younger generation of coaches coming through as well to support them through that, which helps develop the collaboration and the, and, and the close working together. So I, I put it down to, you know, good people who are training them and also the type of approach and philosophy that enables them to put their stamp on the game in the way that they want to whereas perhaps in other, in other countries, they perhaps don't have that open philosophy. OK. Some applause for you there, Neil, which is nice. Um, just one more question from me, and then we'll open it up. Uh, Rhys, I, I, I'm interested, how open a relationship do you have with uh, your contemporaries uh, with the, in the other nations? Uh, you know, is it something that you, 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 you talk about, you know, if somebody's using some new piece of kit you haven't seen before, uh, or is it a sort of closed... No, because you know that's going to give us an advantage. Um, it's quite difficult, really, because my best mate works for England in exactly the same job. Right. Uh, who's my house, my two daughters' uh, godfather, and uh, we've been best men for each other. So, uh, yeah, we do talk uh, quite a lot. But it, it, it's it's amazing. Like Wales is um, is the epicenter for analysis at the moment in in sport, um, and you just have to look at. Um, from my hometown, Porthcawl, um, there's eight um, high um, high up analysts that have just come from that small town. You know, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of working professionally for some very big uh, from, from very, very big teams. So, um, in, in terms of the collaboration, yeah, um, for me, it's it's very important that we collaborate. Um, uh, a lot and like you know most people are doing similar things there is an element of keeping things back um, I think we found um, that the big thing in, in rugby is um, we've been very fortunate to go on two Lions tours but obviously you go on a Lions tour and you give away most of your, your trade secrets because you want, you want that to win and, and that's probably one of the biggest, uh, biggest challenges in terms of you know you're always in a quandary but at the end of the day it's, it's for the greater good because you want to win a test series um, against one of the best teams in the world so um, that collaboration then almost trickles down so every four years you've got to constantly evolve because you know you're giving away most of your trade secrets um, but in terms of the collaboration between uh, between analysts, it's 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 exceptional. To be fair, um, I think uh, there's no egos at all in in our discipline, and and everyone does share quite a lot in terms of kit. You know, because there's not many trade secrets. If something new comes out, you know that unless you've developed it and bespoke um, developed for yourself, you know that that software or whatever will go around and try to sell it to to everyone else and that's where sometimes being a smaller nation with with less resources than than other teams is that what we that's what we tend to uh, have as our approach in terms of work with a company obviously you don't pay as much for it because you're collaborating a lot with it and give away some secrets in terms of what you want to do but then knowing that they can then go and sell it off to more wealthier clients um, but at the end of the day, you've got that first and you've, uh, you've had your input and your spin into it, but also you pay less for it. So that's the kind of approach that we, we, we try to take um, being, you know, being a less resourced uh, and a small country. And that's how we try to compete on the big stage. OK, I, I think that's probably enough uh, from me. Um, let's uh, put it out to the audience. Uh, any questions, please? I think if you wait for the microphone to arrive just at the back there. Hi. Uh, much, much of what we've discussed is, is historical data, which measures performance and, uh, and um, pro progress. How much are you able to use real-time data during an event? So, you know, if there's a rugby match going on, how much can you adjust what's happening based on the data you get in? And if you can use real-time data, can you share that with fans to change the customer experience of, of watching a game or an event? You see it a lot in, um, in motor, motorsport where there's all sorts of telemetry information given out. If you're watching a rugby match, yeah, um, how much can you share real-time data and how much can the coaches make decisions? Okay, so can you use real-time data to change what's happening on the field or the track? And uh, can you share that with customers? Karis, should we start with you on that one? Uh, within cycling, our main real-time data that we use is a coach on, on the side of the track with a stopwatch. Um, all, all our SRM data that is all stored into a box, we have to download that afterwards. 
Um, everything we capture through Dartfish, this is all done afterwards as well. We've got the live footage, which we can have a live feed down to the centre track. But actual data that we use is all on the coach with a stopwatch and his accuracy on our split times. So that is what we use to improve performance. So we know when we're in the team pursuit that if we're up or down on our splits. Um, but apart from that, that's the only real time live data that we use within cycling. And Reese, some, some of the data you're dealing with during a game, can, can you pass that to, to Warren Gatland or Rob Howley and they make a decision that will change the course of the game? Yeah, it was um, the thing I built my career on. Basically, was was trying to do stuff live. Um, it was why wait until why wait until after uh, after the game to try and change something when you know you've just lost by a point um, and everyone gets sacked. You know that's the the kind of thing really. So um, yeah, we have live for us is is our bread and butter. We've got um, between nine and, and thirteen analysts uh, pumping data into myself, um, and then really it's my job as an analyst to try and be the filter because it's a very emotional state. You've got 80,000 people in a stadium, absolutely screaming, you know, and basically what you need to do is give very objective data, um, knowing on our game plan or in terms of what we think an opposition's gonna do. So, yeah, literally I've got, um, I've got probably about, normally on occasions it's about 12 analysts putting lots of data into me. I've got six views uh, around the stadium from different camera sets and stuff. So all I'm trying to do then is filter that data and turn it back into the coaching language. And that's why I'm sitting in front of, of Warren or, or Rob or Sean um, to be able to basically filter all that data. That's why um, data visualization is, is, is massive for us um, because I haven't got time to look at all of that data. I just need basically my vital statistics popping up you know, if there's uh, levels that we're dropping and thresholds are dropping below, I need to know that quite quickly. So the software that we've designed uh, in-house has, has to be very intuitive to the way that um, I want to look at the game so that it can point me in the right direction because there is so, many, so much numbers coming through to me live. And then how we relay that um, is we're very lucky we've got Neil Jenkins who's you know, a great rugby mind and obviously what we can do is if we see something on the tape or from the statistics, we pass a message down to Neil and then he runs on and basically communicates that with, uh, with, with the players basically. So if we need to change something around, basically the next stoppage we can change stuff straight away. Um, and that's all through a filter process where the data's coming in from, from people we trust being filtered by myself, that goes into the coach's language, they decide whether or not they're going to act on it, and then if they do, then that goes down, down to the players on, on the pitch. And um, the second part of your question in terms of the, of the fan data, it's something I've, I've chatted to Opta about, I think it's, it's huge. I think obviously you've got to make it pertinent to what the fan experience wants, you can't just splurge out all of the data that we're collecting, because otherwise again, you get a complete data overload for fans and it actually ruins and takes away from uh, the experience rather than, rather than heightens it. But if you look at um, the NFL, they've, uh, they've just signed a deal with Zebra Technologies, which are RFID um, chip makers. Um, and basically, they've done it for a whole league-wide um, solution, basically to give the fans the player tracking data and the heat map data that you know I know Opta do a little bit for with the football. But again, that's the kind of thing, that the, what you want to do is the insight that the coaches are getting, that's the insight that we need to give to the fans. And, you know, it, it's also an education thing for me, is that, you know, you want to educate the supporters in terms of what they're looking at, why we're doing things, why we're making tactical changes, you know, because ultimately then they, A, they feel part of it, but B, they start to understand a little bit more. And that for me is the, the next five, six years of, of fan integration into, into the stadium experience, or onto the, onto the TV. From your point of view, Simon, because you're actually providing that information for consumers. Yeah, so, I mean, it, as Rhys mentioned, in football we're providing the vast majority, well, certainly in all the top leagues, it's all live data that we're providing. Um, we did some work uh, with IBM um, probably about 18 months ago um, as part of the IBM sponsorship of the RFU of, of, of England Rugby. Um, they built, I don't know if you've seen IBM TriTracker, which is something that they or if you host on their website, and effectively it provides a, an analytical, analytical snapshot of what's happening during a game, um, where the, it's essentially a fan version of what a team's KPI should be if, if they want to win the match. And it's, 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 you know, it's nowhere near as detailed necessarily as the sort of things that the, the guys are doing internally, but it provides a nice snapshot for the fans. Um, the, the one um, stumbling block there always is with 
providing live data, certainly in Stadium, is if any of you have ever been to a game and tried to upload a, an Instagram photo or tweet or something, um, the signal tends to be pretty rubbish. You know, you tend to struggle to kind of um, to do anything, to get access to anything, which obviously is a bit of a stumbling block for people trying to um, access live data. But um, uh, recently, uh, EE, did, as part of their sponsorship of Wembley Stadium, I don't know if you saw this, they provided um, 4G data for everybody at the FA Cup final. And uh, as part of that, they were providing live statistics from, from Opta um, to everybody in the stadium. Uh, we're increasingly seeing it in, in MLS as well in the States, um, whether that's through second screen apps on your, on your phone or, uh, or on the big screens. Uh, again, live data being provided. So that's something that's come on hugely in the last two or three years as technology has, uh, has improved and access to the internet has improved. And finally, the, the other thing that, that data provides that, you know, if you're a fan watching at home, obviously there's, in football, obviously, there's a, there's a three o'clock blackout in terms of watching games. Um, you can listen to the match, but also if you go to a match centre online, the Premier League do this brilliantly. It was part of one of their sponsorships with Carlsberg. There's a match centre online where there are photos being uploaded, pertinent tweets being uploaded, and key statistics being uploaded as well uh, from ourselves. So um, governing bodies, certainly clubs themselves, are starting to realise that, that statistics play a key part in that, that mix for for the fan that can't attend, and, but wants to get the, the information from the stadium. Keith, is there a real-time element to what you do? Can you influence the result of a horse race? And if so, can you tell me about the 3.40 this afternoon, please? No, I, I once parked a horse at 5.40 and came in <laughs> half a six, so that's my, uh, that's my skill with the backing horses, I'm afraid. Uh, no, most of the, uh, of the data is, is, is historical, but it is then sent uh, the, the, on the, in the yard itself. They'll get a, a red, amber, green warning, initial warning, if, 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 if something's out of kilter. Uh, and likewise, the data comes back to the centre in Abu Ghraini, that gets processed to the server there. Then emails will be sent to so three or four people saying, hang on, horse XYZ, uh, have a look at the left, left, left leg. So it's done that way, so it doesn't apply. We are looking at something in terms of um, live data, in terms of acce accelerometers for horses to see whether a horse, whether a jockey, he or she is riding in tandem with a horse. In other words, sometimes a, 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 a jockey can slow down a horse works against it, or they can work with a horse, and, and that's why a good jockey will make a, a, a mediocre horse run faster, and, and is measuring how that's being done, gives some light feed, light feedback, but that, that's the way we get. Okay. And, and, and in football, Neil, can, can data influence the game? Can, can Arsene Wenger be given some data at half-time that, that decides he's going to change the way things are in the second half? Well, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer this, but I think, you know, from, from, from what I see, from, from what I understand, you know, key information... Uh, is important in order to make those tactical changes, those strategic in the um, strategic interventions in the game. But a lot of that is done purely on the, the experience of the coach, what they're seeing, um, the types of information they're they're, they're 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 observing in order to make those key decisions. So I mean, you know, I guess I mean, I, unfortunately, I don't have that detailed insight to to, to really comment anymore. Okay, uh, another question, please. Yes, at the front here. Um, I'd quite like to drag the discussion back to what businesses can learn from the process that uh, these uh, illustrious people are, are describing to us. I bumped into Reese on the way in, and uh, I came second in that collision, by the way. Uh, but um, one of the things he mentioned to me was that um, the honesty of the feedback. So don't, you don't just have the players, sorry, you don't just have the data, but the, um, the feedback to the players is, 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 he said, brutal on occasions. Businesses also collect a lot of information. We sometimes lack the process to make best use of it, and I'm not always sure we're honest. So if the panel can give us some insight onto how to, how to approach that process of, of, sort of data analysis in business and how to make the whole thing more honest, that would be quite useful. Okay. Natalie, how can business <laughs> learn from nice. what you do? Thanks for that question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm not sure what we said, but in cycling and I've worked in other sports as well when we factor feedback data and it can be pretty brutal. Um, previously I was working with swimming providing performance analysis feedback and if someone came out from a race and that wasn't good enough, essentially you had the, the job of sitting there and going through, okay, 
you, you haven't performed how we want you to perform, but then it's going back to having that backup of data and going through the process, kind of like we've discussed today, of questioning why and where you can go from there. So then you start looking at the facts. So within cycling, is that the position on the bike? You know, do we need to just adjust that position on the bike? Do we need to change the team around? Um, you know, it, it's looking at that, that, we've got all that data behind us, you've got the, the actual data from the competition, from the training you've, you've just done. It's about, you know, having that open and establishing the relationship in the first place with the coach and athlete, so you know you can have that honest um, kind of discussion, but at the same time, everyone having the realization that some of these conversations need to be had if we're gonna achieve our goal. So if everyone's 100% committed to achieving that, you know, within cycling, we want to get the girls up to podium, then they know at some point, if they're not performing well, everyone knows that we're going to have to have those conversations to get us to that goal. And as long as that performance is the focus, then, yeah, kind of, that's how we go about and how to achieve it. Um, I'm not sure how well that's answered your question, actually. <laughs> so, Simon, you work in, in a sports-related business rather than sport itself. Do, do you, within your business, use data to provide feedback to, to, to staff? Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. That's, that's quite interesting. Yeah, we do. I mean, so um, the, the way we collect um, data, live data, is um, from video stream. So we have one person collecting data on the home team, one person collecting data on the away team, um, and then a third person doing live checking. So again, to use a football example, if the ball is fired into the wall from a free kick, uh, and the play carries on, we need to assign that block to somebody, but it's pretty much impossible to work out exactly who that ball's hit instantaneously. Therefore, the guys will carry on collecting the information live, uh, and the third person will go back and check frame by frame to see who that, that the, the ball's hit, and you assign the block to them. So we have teams of analysts collecting information in multiple locations across the world, um, in London, in Leeds, in New York, in Montevideo, in Munich, uh, in probably several of the places that I've completely forgotten now. Um, but anyway, and they're all trained using the same definitions. Uh, you trained by the same people and trained to use the same software. It's our own proprietary software that we use to, to collect this information. Um, and because we know who's, well, first of all, because we, we collect it live, but then we go back and redo the information follow it, sort of check the um, information that's collected and review it. We know, so we know who's collected that information on which team. We um, can then understand how many mistakes we had to correct the following day. Um, and we can then assign analysts to the bigger team. So obviously we'd want some of our most experienced, objectively best analysts to be doing the Champions League final, for instance. So therefore, and whereas you would assign somebody who has is either relatively new or you know, has had more, you know, relatively speaking, more errors to create, you'd give them a non-live game to do uh, from a DVD, which allows them to take time and go through and, and you know, be under less pressure to provide information to broadcasters. So in that way, we're using data on ourselves to um, improve our offering to our clients. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's a, that's a reasonable example for you. Okay, yeah, sadly we are just about um, out of time I'm afraid, uh, but before we thank our panel uh, I thought we'd summarise some of the things we've heard today. Um, technology can be used to track everything that happens on a sports field, whether that's an individual or a, or a team sport. Uh, it's used to help players understand the link between training strategies and what actually happens on a field or a track, um, but that technology must be fit for purpose. Younger players tend to buy in more because they're used to the digital world. Uh, Wales and this was an interesting one I thought, is the epicentre for analysis in sport. Um, and finally, data can change the outcome of events, but not horse races. Uh, so uh, if we could put our hands together and, and thank our panel, please. Thank you.